Morning all. Hi. I thought I would change the scenery from our previous lockdown adventures. I never thought I would be back here doing these once more. Uh, but we must continue. We must keep going and carry on. You are doing so well. Uh, currently, the situation, obviously, as you know, we are no longer doing summer exams. However, we do not know how you will still be formally assessed. There will be some form of assessment. So we must continue with the... Uh, uh, with the spec and with the topics so rather than doing philosophy which is what we were originally going to do uh, I'm going to start with the ethics because the ethics are slightly easier I think certainly easier to teach online and then we can fill in gaps when hopefully I see you after February half term so we're going to start with the topic of meta ethics and um, so I'm just going to make myself smaller get the powerpoint up and we'll go from there Okay, so what I would like you to do is just like you did last time, I'd like you to work through the PowerPoint, make your notes as you always do, and then on Friday sessions when I see you, uh, I can go over any specific questions or any problems that you have. So, metaethics is quite a unique topic. It's a standalone topic, is metaethics. Um, we must start by having a look at the view that there are two ethical standpoints. There are two ethical approaches that you can take. There's absolutism and there's relativism. Absolutism is where the morals are fixed, unchanging truths that everyone should follow. Whereas relativism, they're not fixed. They're not absolute. They change individual, culture, time, place, whatever it might be. Relativism and absolutism do not disagree about what is moral. They disagree about what it means to make a moral statement. And this is where metaethics comes in. What we're used to dealing with is what is called normative ethics. Normative ethics are things like you can't utilitarianism, your natural law, your situation ethics. They're normative ethics. That is where it says what you should and should not do, what is and is not good, or what is and is not bad. What metaethics does is it says, no, hang on a minute, what do you actually mean by the words good? So when natural law says, um, you know, it is good to uh for man and woman in marriage to procreate not the procreating marriage part that natural law is telling you to do which is the normative um it is the idea of why is that good what does the word good actually mean so metaethics focuses upon language of ethics this is the ethical language um, it is concerned with whether moral statements refer to fixed truths, so ethical absolutism, or are relative to emotions and beliefs. So are they fixed truths? Are they fixed ethical absolutes? Or are they based on the words good, bad, right and wrong? So it's the four words we're focusing on, no others. Good, bad, right and wrong are the only four words you use in your examples in metaethics. Are these absolute, they're fixed, or are they relative? It also is concerned with how we come to know morals. Is it through senses and observation? Is it intuitive knowledge? Or is it through ethics that aren't linked to any knowledge at all? There are three arguments we need to know. Ethical naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. You'll have done an activity already where you'll have done some research into the three different arguments and done a bit of a, a cut and stick mix and match activity. So now let's see if you've got your information correct. Ethical naturalism is our starting point. This one is probably the trickier one to get your minds around. But once you've got your head around it, it's fairly straightforward. With uh, metaethics, don't overcomplicate it. Don't make it more complicated than it is. By that I mean it's fairly straightforward. You just accept it. The evaluation is also extremely easy in these essays because all you do is you use the three arguments against each other and say which one is better. So evaluation is very straightforward with these essays. The actual material is very straightforward. You just need to accept this is what ethical naturalism says, accept this is what intuitionism says, etc. Also, it's good if you get a start, uh, a standing point. So are you an ethical naturalist? Are you an intu um, intuitionist, etc.? So, with ethical naturalism, oops, let's go back up a little bit. Naturalism is an ethical theory that holds that everything arises from natural properties and causes. 
Thus, morals are fixed absolutes that can be observed as part of the universe. At this stage, don't worry about what all of those different parts means, because as we get further down, it will make more and more sense. The bit to focus on at this point is that it's an, a, a fixed absolute. This is an argument going down absolutism. F.H. Bradley is the name that goes with this, but also Philippa Foote. Uh, she's someone that we used to study on virtue ethics. Very, very interesting. Modern days, Philippa Foote links with Oxfam, the creation of Oxfam. So do check her out if you're interested. Um, they believe that morals can be perceived in the world in the same way that other features of the world are identified. So what do I mean by that? Evil and good, right and wrong, good and bad, are absolute facts. It's important that you recognise they're using the word fact. Fact, they're using that word as your understanding already is. They're not changing the meaning of the word. So these are facts that we're talking about. Morals are not about your opinion. So when you talk about things like abortion, euthanasia, fraud, you're not talking about an opinion. You're talking about an ethical fact. They are objectively true. In other words... Expressing a moral truth, which is part of the reality of the universe, is therefore not an opinion. All of this will make sense in a second when I give you an example. There are links to Aquinas' natural law and how morals and ethics can be seen within nature. So nice little synoptic link there. So once you've got to your grips with ethical naturalism, you can do a little bit of a synoptic link there. Bradley claims that morals are observable. As part of the concrete world, you can see them. So, this now will help you understand what it's saying. You have ethical statements and non-ethical statements. And non-ethical statements are facts about the world. The earth is round. Um, Donald Trump used to be the President of the United States. They're non-ethical facts. They're facts about the world. Ethical statements are statements that use the words good, bad, right and wrong. Abortion is bad. Euthanasia is good. Abortion is right. Euthanasia is wrong or bad, etc. So you're using those four words in whatever way it may be. They are your ethical statements. What ethical naturalism says is, is they're exactly the same thing so the fact would be euthanasia is the premature ending of someone else's life uh, euthanasia is right what ethical naturalism says is they're ethically exactly the same they are observable they are both factual they are both absolute they are both the same sorts of sentences so even though one is a fact and one is ethical, they are both the same. So the example here is Hitler was the leader of the Nazi party. Uh, that is a non-ethical factual statement. Hitler was a bad man. Again, you must use the words good, bad, right or wrong. No others, just for this meta-ethics. Good, bad, right or wrong. So Hitler was a bad man is ethical, but this is also a fact. How? The how is by finding enough evidence to back that up. What ethical naturalists argue is there's so much evidence to back up these statements that they are no longer an opinion. So there is so much evidence to back up uh, the consequence of his actions, the personal attributes that he had, that he was a bad man. That becomes an ethical fact. That becomes an observable fact because of the evidence that you have. So it is exactly the same as saying he is the leader of the Nazi party. What I'd like you to do, please, is I'd like you to come up with your own example of this. So I'd like you to come up with your own ethical statement and your own non-ethical statement. It can be anything you want. Absolutely anything. Don't do the Nazi one because everyone will do the Nazi one. Pick something different. It can be anything. As long as your ethical statement has good, bad, right or wrong in it, and as long as the non-ethical statement is somehow linked to that idea, it can be anything. I've had things about John Lennon in the past. Make it a bit different. Uh, give you a little bit creative flair to make your essays um, more varied. So come up with your own ethical naturalism example. Ethical naturalism advocates the belief that a statement could only be factual and have meaning if it can be verified empirically. That bit is very, very important. You have to be able to verify empirically. You have to be able to prove using senses that statement is a fact. So even though you're using an ethical word, you can find enough evidence to prove that that is fact. 
Ethical sentences express propositions. A proposition is a statement of reason or, or logic. Uh, propositions are made true by objective features of the world, independent of human opinion. So Hitler is a bad man, or Hitler was a bad man. There is so much evidence, there is so much to back that up, that it is an objective feature of the world. The facts are part of the world. That isn't an ethical statement as far as an opinion. It is an ethical fact. It's an absolute uh, fact using evidence from the world. However, so that's the argument. That's it. Ethical naturalism done. The easiest way to talk about that one in your exam is to give an example. Start by the example. Use your example to break down different parts. This thing gets slightly harder, so this bit's slightly more complicated. David Hume is a critic of ethical naturalism. Of course he is. David Hume criticises everybody and everything. He says, moral good and evil cannot be distinguished using reason. We cannot move from an objecti objective factual statement based on observations of the world, facts, to a subjective moral one. He's basically saying... Hitler was the leader of the Nazi party, Hitler was a bad man, you can't put them together. Fair enough. Why? For example, forensic, a man is dead, fact, you're verified, but you cannot find evidence of the wrongness of that murder. This led to what is known as Hume's Law. Is does not imply ought. Now what does that mean? Is are facts. So a man is dead, and is is a fact. Hitler is the leader of the Nazi party. That's a fact, obviously was was past tense. But is is facts. Ought is a moral behaviour. You ought not do that. You ought do this. That is about a moral behaviour. You're prescribing a behaviour you would like people to do. So what he's saying is, is when you're saying you ought or not carry out euthanasia, you're prescribing a behaviour, that's not a fact, you're, you're trying to influence an ethical, uh, an ethical angle. So he says no amount of fact is ever sufficient to lead to an ethical conclusion, so no amount of evidence that well, what Hitler did will ever surmount to enough to make Hitler as a bad man a fact, it is still an opinion, it is still, when using those Four words, so in this case of the word bad, that, that is an ethical statement, it is not a factual statement. There he is, David Hume. Tis the object of feeling, not of reason. It lies in its in yourself, not in the objects. So again, in yourself, meaning your opinion, not in the object in the natural world, so in the um in his book. So With ethical naturalism, all you have to understand and take is that they are arguing that ethical statements and facts are the same thing. They are observable in the natural world, they are ethical absolutes, they are facts. What David Hume is arguing is, no, this is not the case. Is are facts, oughts are uh, ethical opinions, moral behaviours, they are not the same thing. That's the argument in a nutshell. Philippa Foote, though, of course, defends ethical naturalism. She came after um, David Hume. She was far more recent. Um, the fact that a human action or disposition is good of its kind is a fact about a given feature. What does she mean by that? Let's have a look. British nationalist philosopher Philippa Foote argued that when we call a person a just man or an honest woman, we are referring to something, uh, we are referring to something, some evidence backs this up. So, for example, when I do your references or your UCAS, I will say you are um, open minded or you are um, hard working. I'm making those statements based on evidence. So, when we say Hitler is a bad man, we're basing it on evidence. We're referring to something, we're backing this up. Virtues can be observed by watching how a person acts. An honest person does honest things, and honest things can be observed. Therefore, they are perceived as moral absolutes. So what Philippa Foote is arguing here is because you can observe them, and that is a factual thing that you have evidence for. So, for example, if I say you're hardworking, I will have physical evidence to show how you are a hard worker. Because I have physical evidence, it then becomes a fact about you. You are a hard worker. That is a fact. But obviously, in this case, we're not talking about hard working. We're talking about, so I could say, you are a good person 
student. I would have evidence to back up that you are a good student. So I'd have evidence of your organisation, your deadline meeting, your attendance, etc. So I would say you are a good student and have evidence to back that up. What Philippa Foote is saying is because you have perceivable, observable evidence, that then becomes a fact. It is a fact you are a good student, uh, just as well as it's a fact that your name is whatever it is or your age is whatever it is. They are exactly the same. Your age and that you are a good student are both factual statements and should be taken exactly the same way. Philippa Foote continued, Foote draws upon writer uh, Kropotkin's example of when an anthropologist goes to study the native Malayan people under the strict instructions never to take photographs. One night the anthropologist has the opportunity to take a picture when one of the natives is sleeping but he stops himself because of the promise he has made. Such rules are natural and absolute. Humans have developed ways to live well together and have developed rules to ensure everyone can live happily together. So what Philippa Foote is arguing here using this example is that we make promises, we make agreements, when we stick to them. These are things that are natural and absolute to us. So what I want you to do with Philippa Foote is to have a look at a few things about her. Um, I want you to also use this opportunity to have a look a little bit into Aristotle's virtue ethics. Now when the spec changed I was really ever so disappointed when they took out virtue ethics. Virtue ethics is one of my favourite uh, topics. I preferred Aristotle's virtue ethics far beyond Aristotle's philosophy. I think Aristotle's virtue ethics is very, very clever. So if you would like to have a look at things like arete, the golden mean, the vices and virtues and the patterns of behaviour, this again really helps you understand ethics. Um, and then you can make links between virtue ethics, Aristotle's virtue ethics and Philippa Foote's ethical naturalism. And again, that gives you that AA star perspective because you're taking it to that next level, that next stage. Um, so when it comes to... Sorry, my machine is talking to me. No, that's fine. It's just telling me I'm using a lot of uh, energy uh, on my Mac. Um, so when it comes to ethical naturalism, that is the, the structure. You've got the, the argument with your example, you've got Hume's comeback, you've got Philippa Foote's defence. All you need to do is decide whose side are you on. Are you David Hume? Are you Philippa Foote and Bradley? Obviously, when you get to intuitionism and motivism, you'll be able to see far better where you are. But you need to decide when you use statements like something is good or something is bad. Are you Do you believe this is a fact when you say abortion is right do you believe that is a fact or do you still think that is still an opinion however much evidence you get that is an opinion that's what you need to ask yourself think about any ethical statements when you use the terms good bad right or wrong uh, do you believe them as fact right so um i also need you to think about the strengths and weaknesses as we go along obviously i'm going to give you a few here but you need to do far far more um, and there will be an activity coming out later next week where you need to really think about your strengths and weaknesses but a few weaknesses of ethical naturalism right and wrong are subjective they're not objective you need humans to exist to determine how we should live so they're not objective from humans you need humans to be able to establish the right and wrongness of them Regardless of whether a situation may have evidence to support that it's right, such as euthanasia, it still breaks the law, so it's just essentially pointless. You could get endless amounts of uh, evidence to back up that euthanasia is right or euthanasia is good. It's still against the law. What's the point? Do ethical and moral situations have evidence? Which evidence do we accept and ignore? So I'm saying Hitler is a bad man, but I'm completely ignoring the fact that he won a medal for bravery in the Second World War for being a go-between over very dangerous land. I've forgotten that. I've forgotten how he was very, very caring towards animals and his dog. I've left out the fact that he was probably a very loving partner to Ava Braun or, or wife, um, so uh, to his wife. So I've left all those bits out to only get evidence to support that Hitler was a bad man. Is that again fair? What evidence do you accept? What evidence do you ignore? Mackie does argue that the rules themselves are not hard facts. They are accepted to varying degrees by all those inside the institution. So again, basically saying it's biased. Right, so intuitionism time.
Intuitionism, main name is G.E. Moore. Now, Moore K has cropped up over the course of your time with me, but this is where he really falls. G.E. Moore believed that we should do the thing that it causes most good to exist. Moral truths are indefinable, but self-evident through intuition. Moore was particularly concerned with rejecting utilitarianism, which argued that goodness can be defined, quantified and qualified. So let's just break this all down a little bit more. He's saying that you can't define them. He's saying you can't define what moral truths are. You just know them. They're just self-evident. It's just something that you know. And, and he rejects utilitarianism. Nice synoptic link there. You could also use G.E. Moore against utilitarianism if you did a utilitarianism essay. So nice link there between them. Because he says that you can't define goodness. You can't quantify it. Do you remember the hedonic calculus trying to quantify happiness, more happiness, purity, etc. Or qualify it higher and lower. So he says you can't do this. He gives good as uh, his example. He says good is a simple notion, a basic notion like yellow. Yellow is the example that he gives. He says you know when you see it. So, for example, a dog, for example, can be broken down into different qualities, an animal, mammal, etc. Whereas good is just good. Yellow is just yellow. It's like trying to explain yellowness to somebody that's never seen before, to a blind person. How would you describe yellow? You can't. Yellow is indefinable, just like goodness. Um, over the years, there's so many um, teaching, uh, teaching tips. We get so much advice of do this, don't do this, mark in green, don't mark in green, mark in red, don't mark in red, use visual as well as odd. We get so many things as teachers to guide us down what is the best way to learn. And one of the things always crops up is use of the word good in feedback. And that you shouldn't, and I am criminal to this, you shouldn't use the word good in feedback because it actually doesn't mean anything. It's not definable. You know that it's a positive term, so you know that you've done something good, but it doesn't actually mean anything. But you know self-evidently what it means. Goodness is indefinable, such as yellow. We know what is yellow and can be rec and can recognise it, but we cannot actually define it or describe the particular qualities of it. If I am asked what is good, my answer is that good is good, and that's the end of the matter in Principia Ethica. Good is good. Good isn't anything else. A dog is a mammal, a dog is an animal. Good is just good. Yellow is just yellow. And so that's the examples that he uses. But you understand the meanings because they're self-evident. Jean Moore continues uh, the attempts to define good in terms of something that can be verified or falsified uh, uh, is to commit naturalistic fallacy. So he is once again going against ethical naturalism. So this is directly against ethical naturalism. Jean Moore continued that... Um, verified or falsified meaning you prove something true or false. You cannot prove something true or false. And if you do, you commit naturalistic fallacy. So it, he believes that ethical naturalism committed the naturalistic fallacy. G.E. Moore was influenced by Hume's is-ought distinction. So it's the is-ought distinction, basically. He just renamed it the naturalistic fallacy. Moore argued that you cannot identify goodness an ethical statement, with a natural quality statement about the world, a non-ethical statement. So basically, again, you cannot put them together. You cannot infer from a description about how the world is to how the world ought to be. So again, euthanasia is the premature ending of someone's life. You cannot then get how you ought to behave from that. They are separate statements, is and ought distinction. And if you believe that you can prove uh, true or false, then you commit the naturalistic fallacy. Again, we can, we're familiar with the word fallacy. Fallacy is this idea of finding uh, fault in statements that are made. Um, and obviously naturalistic, because it's called ethical naturalism. Let me just go back to that for one second. In an essay, you do not need to do Hume and G.E. Moore, because they're the same argument. You don't need to do Hume's is ought and then G.E. Moore's naturalistic fallacy. My advice actually would be to do 
ethical naturalism and use GE more against it. And then you say whether intuitionism, whether you just know it's self-evident and what it means, or whether you believe they're facts and ethical statements are the same, you need to decide then which angle you are going down. Are you team GE Moore or are you team Bradley? So I, I would advise just picking one or the other, pick Hume or GE Moore. I think GE Moore is easier to use because he links in them with intuitionism. Oh, sorry, folks. The joys of teaching from home. Hopefully this has continued and you can still see and hear me. I'll be very upset if you can't and I have to do it all again. But we'll keep going. That's all we can do, Cat, with teaching from uh, home in these situations. Right, we bring in, at this point, H.A. Pritchard. So H.A. Pritchard, with his white hair and his very dark moustache, he built on Moore's work. He said that reason collects the facts and intuition, I always do this, I always think of intuition like in your brain, your thoughts. Intuition determines which course of action to follow. So you collect the facts and then you determine through intuition what you should do. He distinguished between general thinking, reasoning, uh, used to assess the facts in the situation, and moral thinking. This is the immediate intuition of what you should do. You see somebody suddenly collapse in the street. Your reasoning immediately is they look like they've had a heart attack, they're having a stroke, they're looking in discomfort, in pain, something is wrong, what is happening? Your moral thinking, that immediate intuition is I must go over them to help, I must ring 999, uh, etc. So that's the process that you go through. He recognised that different people have different intuitions about what is right and wrong. We then bring W.D. Ross in. This was Pritchard's student, so it's a bit like... Um, um, a passing on the torch of intuitionism. W.D. Ross, he says, what is right is always unique depending on what is morally suitable for the person, the situation a person is in. You never know all the facts about a situation. You base your judgments about what is right and wrong on your intuition. That's a fair point. You never know all the facts. Even when you're in a, a hospital and you're helping somebody, you never know all the facts about a situation. It's obvious that certain types of actions are right, though. And so he called these prima facie duties. These are, so these are actions that are always uh, right. Fidelity, keeping your promises. Reparation, when you've done something wrong, repair it, you know, recognise it, gratitude, being grateful, being thankful, justice, beneficence, so helping others, benefiting others, self-improvement and non-maleficence, so don't harm others, don't be malicious. So again, with these three, G.E. Moore, Pritchard and Ross, and I think there might be someone else on the last side, I can't remember if he's still there or not, they don't really add anything immensely extra to what GE Moore's already said. So my advice would be just to learn a little bit about Pritchard, so just the two types of thinking would be enough, a little bit about Ross, which would just be the prima facie duties, that would be plenty, and again, you evaluate. Do they work? Do they not work? Is it a good way of thinking? Is it not a good way of thinking? Oh, and if the duties conflict, that you follow first sight duties. Again, go by your intuition, intuition, that gut feeling. So, again, you need to work through the strengths and weaknesses. What do you think about intuition? Is my team intuition? Do you think you know what is good and bad through intuition? You just know it. Few problems are to get you started. More does not explain nor prove how we know through good through... Start that one again. Good through intuition alone and not through senses. What that means is, what is intuition? Where is intuition? Does everyone 
have intuition? Do you have the same intuition throughout your life? Does it develop so you become more ethical? Or does a five-year-old have the same intuition as an adult? Do male and female have the same intuition? He doesn't explain any of it. He doesn't say what it is. He doesn't say it because he says to not use senses, just use intuition alone. How do you not use senses? All those problems that we used to have with Plato, you know, how do you turn off your senses? How do you know your intuition is based on intuition and not your senses? A lot of questions that go unanswered. How can we be sure our intuitions are correct? What happens if they conflict? And JL Mackey once more argues that morality is not just about what a person believes is intuitively right. It's about doing something about it. Now, I think that's a brilliant point. Um, and when we do conscience, we'll see this idea of action. And um, this is why, again, just making a little uh, link back, this is why I like liberation theology so much. This idea of... Um, orthopraxy over orthodoxy this idea of actually doing something about it so it's all well and good intuitively knowing what is right or wrong but if you don't do anything about it again what's the point it has to lead to some action and that's when you move down the normative uh, route finally final section as always with these videos pause them make your notes come back to them um fill you know you work through and create your notes as uh, best suits you emotivism aj ayer he's going to come up when we do ethical uh sorry religious language so when we start philosophy we've got two religious language topics aj ayer crops up there as well as part of his work with the vienna circle the vienna circle was basically it sounds very interesting it probably really was not, uh, the Vienna Circle was just a bunch of blokes that got together in Vienna, had a little power with their whiskies and their cigars and said, oh, what shall we call ourselves? Let's call ourselves the Vienna Circle. And they sat around and talked about philosophy because what else do you do? And um, he drew upon the thinking of David Hume. Ayer believed that there are three types of statements, logical, analytical, factual, synthetic and moral. Emotivism is ethical non-naturalism. Oh, we'll come back to it. Because it rejects the view that morals tell you anything about the external world. All right, so. Ethical non-naturalism sounds very complicated. It really is not. Break it down. Ethical, right, wrong, good and bad. Non-naturalism basically is saying it's going against ethical naturalism. Ethical naturalism is arguing that good, bad, right and wrong are facts in nature. This is saying it rejects that view completely. Morals do not have any link to the world. They are nothing to do with facts. That's all that means. Oh, going back up. Moves away from the claim that moral language has some kind of absolute meaning. Morals are only relative to our feelings and emotions and therefore cannot be verified through science or maths. Therefore, these tell us about the person, not the external world. So if somebody says to you, um, I believe it's the right thing to be a whistleblower, that is them telling, that tells you something about them as a person, not about the world as a whole. In other words, good, bad, right and wrong express approval or disapproval. So if somebody said to you, um, I'm considering having an abortion and you go, that is bad, you're expressing approval or disapproval. So you are expressing approval or disapproval on the decision that they are making. This then comes the boo hurrah theory. This is um, one of those things that you can't really mention without smiling. It's the idea that moral statements express an emotion. So basically, when you say something is bad, you are, in other words, just going boo at what they're saying. Not boo like a ghost, but like boo, like bad. I can't believe I had to film myself doing that. Um, and hurrah or hooray is in hurrah, hooray, yay, as in we agree, that's right, yes, let's do that. Um... Oh, that is emotivism. So that is saying that when you are using the words good, bad, right and wrong, you are expressing something about yourself just like basically saying boo or hurrah to something. Moving on quickly. 
C.L. Stevenson it crops up into this one. There he is, C.L. Stevenson. Uh, we come across names in this that we probably will never come across again in any other topics. AJ, as I said, do comes, does come back up, but people like Stevenson does not. He is interested in how moral statements are used and what results they are intended to produce. So moral statements, he says, contain an element that expresses an attitude relative to a fundamental belief and an element that seeks to persuade or influence others. So... In all those words and bumble, what he's basically saying is, is that when you use the words good, bad, right or wrong, you're actually trying to persuade or influence the person you're talking to. So when you say, you know, if somebody's talking about IVF, for example, should I have IVF? And you go, hooray, or what a good idea. You're then trying to persuade or influence them of, yes, I think you should do that. And so you're trying to influence or persuade others. There's AJ Ayer. So AJ Ayer, yes, he does look like Roadrunner, as many students over the years have said. He says, and the man who is ostensibly contradicting me is merely expressing his moral sentiments. So there is plainly no sense in asking which of us is in the right, for neither of us is asserting a genuine proposition. In language, truth and logic, I do have that book on my bookshelf. It is fairly dull. Um, what he's saying there again in all those words uh, is actually very, very good. What he's saying is that, is that when somebody contradicts you, when somebody doesn't agree with you, when someone has a different opinion to you, there is no point asking which of you is right. Because neither of you is right. He's basically saying, um, AJ Ayer, is that neither of you are asserting a genuine true proposition. So you just need to accept that they are saying something different to what you're saying. Because it's based on emotions, not fact. He's a facts man, as we'll find out when uh, we do uh, religious language. A is saw disagreements as arguments based on preference, whereas Stevenson saw them as arguments based on different beliefs. And again, you need to be able to evaluate emotivism. Part of being human is to express emotions, especially in moral situations. So it's quite a strength of it, really, that it is based on emotions, because often people do see ethical statements as based on emotions. Everyone can understand the theory and apply it. Everyone's opinions are equally valid. Um, however, ethics based on attitudes, upbringings, feelings, is emotivism just simply subjectivism? James Rachels, he was a critic in euthanasia. Um, he points out that moral judgments appeal to reasoning, not just expressions of feelings. So he's actually saying, no, there is some fact there, not just an emotional response. Finally, Alistair McIntyre questions Stevenson's views about how moral views are actually formed in the first place. He calls emotivism opaque. It does not give any help in explaining how we can dis distinguish the feelings and attitudes that are moral from all the feelings and attitudes that we might have. It's a fair point. How do you know which, when you're making moral statements or when you're expressing feelings and attitudes how do you distinguish them from uh, other statements and other attitudes etc so very very hard to distinguish the reason i've given you some strengths there is not because i think emotivism is the better argument i actually think it's the worst that's why i've given you some strengths to help you um you need to now decide and one of your activities uh, coming in the next couple of lessons will be to decide and justify which team you are on are you team ethical naturalism team intuitionism or team emotivism now it's really probably not something that you are particularly you know you're not jumping up and down in your seats going wow i'm an intuitionist the light bulbs come on uh, you know everything is clear uh, yeah i'm not expecting that you just need to pick a side and argue it. So it might just be a weighing up of which which one is better than the others, which is the best of a bad bunch sort of thing. So you do need to decide that at some point. So yeah, there you go. Are you team ethical naturalism, intuitionism or emotivism? So that's the argument. That's it. My advice is to keep working through this. Do not overcomplicate it. That is by far enough information for you to be able to write an essay on it. You need to work on the evaluation, however, so you need to make sure that you can do strengths and weaknesses of each approach. You can. You need to make sure you can use them against each other as well. It's very, very important. Um, 
I will be setting work as we go along for this and then we're going to start conscience next week so we're going to go straight fire into conscience because again what I would like to do is I'd like to cover as much content as we can whilst at home and then we can do a lot more of the revision recapping filling in the gaps the testing the essays the mock exams the central assess grades whatever it might be will give us time when we're back in the classroom so please work through this if, if of course you have any questions before friday's uh little get together please send me an email i'm more than happy to go over it but of course you have the internet at your fingertips google it have a look see what's out there um obviously you also have the blog as well for a little bit more um information and details etc uh, but i'm also i'm always just at the end of an email if you do need my help uh, so thank you very much everybody i will see you on friday um bye for now guys just gonna cancel all of this down